I'm done. You're a rat back. You I'm are asking. A, you're a complete rat back. Am I? Yeah. Like, no, you're not. Just that's not nice. Um, just like, but no. Yahweh Jireh uh, is mentioned by Abraham in Genesis 22. Give us a quick context. Oh, that's where, where he's going to sacrifice. His, God asks him to sacrifice his son. Isaac says to him, you know, where's the lamb? He says, oh, God will provide and they get up on the mountain. But Abraham has trusted God and God has honoured that trust. And so now for Mount Moriah, when he would see that mountain and his mind would go, that's where God did that. That's where God provided, that's my marker. I'm that's reminded marker. of God's goodness. I'm reminded of God's goodness. You often find references to God is my, God is my, God is my, whatever. Yeah. Psalm 18 has in it the uh, psalm that follows on from David being delivered from the hand of Saul and others of his enemy. Yeah. And he says, Yahweh is my protector, he is my strong fortress, he is my protection, and with him I am safe, he protects me like a shield, he defends me and keeps me safe. God has delivered him from his enemies, mm. and when he wants to express that, he expresses it in terms that relate to his deliverance. He's been delivered in battle, yes. so in his expression, he's going to be giving that analogy. Giving yeah. that analogy. Yeah. If that's who he was for David, that's who he can be for me in the situation that I'm in. It's like Paul, right? Paul in Philippians says, I have learned to be content. God says, no. My, my grace is sufficient. sufficient. Hmm. He speaks about learning, right? And learning means that you have had to have gone through experiences where you must have questioned, but he's learned that. It didn't just happen. There was an experience that led him to experiences that led him to learn that, and Abraham had an experience that led him to learn that Yahweh is his provider. It's important for us to actually be have our eyes open, so to speak. Right now, I cannot see how God can provide for me. I just cannot see it. But my memory, right, mm. says. Well, if he did it then, I have to trust that he can do it now, even though I can't see in any way, shape or form how he could do it. Paul knew how to be content. David was convinced because he'd been delivered so many times. Yep. And Abraham showed us the first part, the first lesson of naming God, Jaira. Mm. And you prove it with your own life as well. Yeah. <laughs> We all do. When we've all we, we got all, a while, we, we all, understand. We all do, but, but you recognise that it's got nothing to do with you. It's all got to do with you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Phil, once again for that. Are you enjoying those insights? Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. This guy, he knows so much. Okay, it takes Justin three hours to record that, and then he has to synthesize it down to three minutes. If you've ever heard Phil talk, you know that, right? Right, right. So, we love you, Phil. So if you want the unedited version, see Justin. And actually, he won't give those to you. But anyway, it's been good fun. I'm enjoying this series. I hope you're learning something uh, through this series. The series is called "I Am," and we're looking at different names of God so that hopefully our understanding of who he is will be deepened and that our love for him will grow and our, our faith in him will be strengthened. That's our goal. In fact, there's a verse in Psalms that, that really outlines that. It says, and those who know your name put their trust in you. And that's our heart for this series. And we hope that you are coming along and learning a little bit more about God and it's strengthening your faith. In 1986, who remembers 1986? All right, a fair few of us, but a fair few of us don't. That is really scary. I remember 1986 vividly because that's the year that I got married. And yes, we were 12 years old when we got married. So, um, <laughs> but something else happened in 1986, and I've got my friend Noel here. He's uh, back from a holiday, and uh, I, I'm so glad. He's got so much energy back here on the keyboard. He's going to help me out because in 1986, there was a guy called Don Moen. Anybody know the name Don Moen? All right. He became part of a movement that corrupted church forever by bringing praise songs into the church. 
right? You know that Pentecostal two-step that Justin taught you a little bit earlier? That's actually not a Pentecostal two-step. That's actually a Jewish dance. The, the kick, right? Jehovah Jireh, right, right? The, the song, you know it? Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think we're not going to do that. Yeah. If I was Justin, we'd be doing that for the next 20 minutes because, because he's talented like that. But thanks, thanks so much for Noel. Give Noel a hand. Thanks for that. You know, I, I reckon that's an old Jewish dance song. And when, when I told you that I got married in 1986, and I wish I'd done that for my wedding because the message of Jehovah Jireh, my provider, yeah, and he's continued to provide. I've got a wife of 30-something years. She's not here today, so that's good that I can't tell you exactly the number. By I think it's 33. But Yahweh Yireh, my provider. That song was inspired by an account in the historical book of Genesis. It's part of the Jewish scriptures, which is now part of our Bible. Chapter 22. Chapter 22, we see an interaction between God and Abraham. Abraham was a real person that God was speaking to and doing life with. And God had chosen Abraham for a special purpose. He told Abraham, the first interaction he had with him that we have recorded, said, Abraham, I want you to leave your country and go to a land that I'm going to show you and tell you about later. That's a big deal right there, okay? And Abraham went, and then he later on told Abraham that I'm going to give you lots of offspring. Now, Abraham is about 80 years old at this time, where he's saying, I'm going to give you lots of offspring. How many of you are 80 years old or older? How many of you think you're going to get lots of offspring from this point onward? Because he had no offspring at this point, all right? And he said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, Great promise there. So then fast forward, and when Abraham was about 100 years old, Sarah, his wife, was 90. They had the promised child, Isaac. We'll tell you a little bit more about another child a little bit later, but Isaac was the promised son, and he was born to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. Now, when we pick up the account in Genesis chapter 22, Isaac is very likely an older teenager, maybe even pushing 20 years old at this stage, okay? You need to remember that. That's very important to understand how this all plays out. So in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, it says this, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Now, when you read words like that, you know it's about to get interesting, Right? When God is going to test someone's faith, it's going to be interesting. Now, Abraham did not have the luxury of reading those first few words of verse 1 before he went through what we're about to describe. That's important for you to understand as well. It says, God pro- decided to test Abraham's faith. Abraham wasn't in on that part. He didn't know, oh, there's a test coming, so he couldn't prepare for the test. He just had to follow along. If Abraham had known that this was a test, it would have changed everything because it wouldn't have required any faith in him. It would have been, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go along with this. Abraham did not know this was a test. When we know the end of something, it changes the way we behave. We don't have to have faith. We don't have to have trust in anything when we know what the outcome eventually is going to be. You need to remember that as well. Then he says this, continuing in verse 1. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, I, here I am. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. And go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Now think about everything else I just told you. Isaac was that promised son that was going to make Abraham a father of many nations. And now God says, go sacrifice your son. God is giving Abraham a ridiculous request here. I, I, I really believe this request is ridiculous. I'm not saying that for, for effect or anything. I think God asked Abraham to do something that was absolutely ridiculous. It made no sense whatsoever. He says, take your kid. 
and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Now, child sacrifice was something that the pagans did back in that day in the land of Canaan near where Abraham was. But that was not in God's economy. That would have never been something that God's people would be doing, sacrificing children. And by the way, in case uh, you, you doze off and you forget the rest of the message, just because God told him to sacrifice Isaac, we don't do child sacrifices. Okay? Do not go home and sacrifice your children no matter what they do. Right? Think about it for a moment, what that means. Now, don't judge me, but I went deer hunting about 30 years ago, one time, and I got a deer. This was back in the States where you do stuff like that, and it's part of the culture, and, you know, it's kind of a rite of passage, you know. You got to be, mm, huh? anyway, I shot a deer, and I was excited because I shot my first deer, But I was also sad. And the sadness became greater when I went up to the deer and I approached it and saw it lying there. And my pastor, who's the one that had taken me hunting, he was trying to disciple me. Um, He told me, he said, okay, now we have to dress the deer. Which meant taking out a knife, slicing it along its belly and watching what happens when that happens and it smells awful. And I got to tell you, the thrill of being a, you've heard the term Nimrod, it's a biblical name, means great white hunter. Well, I was the great white hunter that day, but it didn't feel that exciting when I was watching the innards of a deer being gushed out on the ground. Now, I'm sorry if that's too graphic for you. Um, Kids are next door, most of them. Hey, girls. (laughs) That sounds really gross, doesn't it? Yeah. But imagine this, okay? That was a deer. This is what Abraham's being asked to do to his son. To lay him on an altar, take a knife, literally cut him open so he can bleed out and die, and then to burn the carcass and offer that to God as a sacrifice. That was hard for me with the deer, and it was supposed to be a good thing. I cannot imagine what Abraham would have felt. Now, let's take this a little bit further, because Abraham's going to do this, and, you know, Isaac has a mom, right? Imagine going to the mom and saying, hey, babe, um, just heard from God. He said, I've got to take Isaac up and offer him a sacrif- as a sacrifice, a burnt offering. Imagine that, going to your wife and saying, I've got to take my kid. My wife would say, which one? So... To make her assessment based on that, actually, she wouldn't. I'm the one that would say that. She loves all of our kids equally, and so do I, kids listening on podcasts. Oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Uh, But that's normal, isn't it? But imagine this. This is bigger than that even, because Isaac is the promised seed. He's the miracle child of their, their old age that they had waited for so long, and it was through him that God was going to make Abraham the father of many nations and bless all the nations of the world because of this son. Their whole future was built around Isaac and what God had planned for Isaac. And God is asking Abraham to destroy all hope at this point. Is that a ridiculous request or what? I, I think it is. See, when God asked Ab- what did God ask Abraham to do went against all common sense. It went against all human reasoning. It went against his lifelong ambitions. It went against everything earthly. But that's when our faith gets tested. Warren Wiersbe says it like this. Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable. Do what seems unreasonable. And expect what seems impossible. That, friends, is when our faith really gets tested. Continuing on in the story, it says this, verse 3. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. 
Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. Pause there for a second. He told the servants, you stay here. We're going up there. Had the servants went up the mountain with him, what do you think would have happened? The servants would have stopped him. The servants would have said, are you out of your mind, Abraham? I know you said you heard from God, but I think it's probably dementia. You are well over 100 years old now. They would have stopped him from following through with what God had asked him to do. You know what that tells me? And I'm speaking to leaders in the room and you boys brigade, uh, uh, young men and all the other leaders in the room. You know, sometimes we have to go it alone. Sometimes those around us will try to stop us. And we have to keep moving on. We have to say, well, you know, if you can't go with me that, to that next level, then you can stay here, but I'm going because God's called me. And that's okay because you need to understand that the servants Abraham left behind when he, they went up on the mountain, the servants hadn't gotten that vision, hadn't got that calling from God. But Abraham had, and he had to go through with that no matter what. We need to understand that as leaders in, in this place. And, and that's something that was brand new this morning, by the way, and I believe there's somebody here that needed to hear it. That's why God gave it to me this morning. We need to sometimes have to go it alone. Verse 6, picking that back up, says, So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. Amen. See, there was a ridiculous request that came from God. Abraham offered God a righteous response. He offered God a righteous response. Romans chapter 4 verse 3 says this, Abraham believed God and God counted him as, a, as righteous because of his faith. He had faith. And God said that makes you righteous because you believed, because you had faith. Abraham obeyed immediately. There was no debating. There's no record of any hesitation. He got up early in the morning, it said, to prepare for this trip that, that God was sending him on. This wasn't always Abraham's MO, though. Lest you think Abraham was perfect and you can't be like Abraham. Abraham failed to trust God many, many times. A couple uh, of big ones is uh, as they were journeying, uh, they went to the, this one place where uh, him and Sarah were there. And they, the king decided Sarah was uh, not too hard on the eyes and that uh, he might like her for one of his harem and that kind of thing. So a Abraham said, okay, okay, tell them you're my sister because if, you're my, if I'm your husband, then they're going to kill me and take you from me. He didn't trust God, so he lied. And then, remember, he was getting old before Isaac was born? Well, there was this incident where, as they're getting old, Sarah, wise woman, said, You know what, Abraham? I'm old. I haven't given you kids yet, but I've got a handmaid over here named Hagar. How about you have a kid with her? Maybe that's how God will provide. And Abraham thought, I guess. And he had a child with Hagar. His name was Ishmael. And the Middle East has never been the same ever since. Abraham was not always ready to follow God when he said. But Abraham had learned. He had journeyed with God. And he realized that God would deliver on his promises because of the history he had with him. Abraham believed the promise God had made that I'm going to give you heaps of descendants. I'm going to give you lots of grandchildren through Isaac. So he rested in that. He displayed that faith two times in that passage that we just read. He displayed it once when he told the servants, hey, you stay here. The lad and I are going to go up and we're going to worship and we will come back together. That's, that's a statement of faith. That's a declaration that he believed Isaac was coming down off the mountain. And then in verse 8, as he was walking, Isaac said, well, hey, we got the wood and we got the fire, Dad. What about the lamb? And Abraham said, declare God will provide a lamb. 
statements of faith. He was trusting God. Abraham understood that even though the request seemed ridiculous, what God had already promised would have to be, be followed through on because that's who God is. He knew that God would be faithful to his promises. So he trusted him and he followed. His assessment, we, we can fast forward to Hebrews chapter 11 in our New Testament, and it says the reason Abraham was able to do this is because he believed that even if Isaac died, God was able to raise him from the dead. Amen. So that, that's what Abraham was going up there. He really thought he was going to kill Isaac. And, and you, if you're not a church person, you don't know how this ends yet, do you? Anyway, we'll get there. He believed God would raise him from the dead to fulfill his promises. Amen. He trusted God. Reminds me of a missionary named George Mueller. Anybody heard of George, George Mueller? Some of us oldies. George Mueller was uh, an Englishman, and he started orphanages, and uh, uh, he, 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 there was tens of thousands of children whose lives were changed because he started orphanages. There's one account that's told where one day the, the house mom had got the kids all up, and they were all dressed and ready for school. House mom came to George. There was 300 kids and said, the kids are all dressed, ready for school, but there is no breakfast. So George said, okay, well, sit the kids down at the tables and get them ready for breakfast. I'm the house mom. I'm thinking, I just told you, George, there's no breakfast, right? So George said, sit them down. And then George Mueller prayed. And he did this on many occasions. But this one specific story, he prayed. And at the end of his prayer, there was a knock at the door. It was the local baker. And he said, I got up in the middle of the night because somehow I knew you were going to need bread this morning. And he was delivering that bread. He laughed. The kids are getting ready to eat the bread. And another knock at the door. It's the local milkman whose cart had broken down just in front of the orphanage. And he said, by the time I change this will and everything, the milk is going to be spoiled. Do you want the milk? So the kids had breakfast that day. And it's great to know that, hearing the end of the story. But imagine being George Mueller when the housemaid said, there's no breakfast. And he had the faith and the trust in God's provision to say, sit the kids down. And he prayed and thanked God for the food. Amen. That's tremendous faith. You know, I wonder why it is as believers. It seems like to me, the longer we journey with God, for those of you who have been journeying with God for a while, we become more and more risk averse. You know, when we first trust Christ, our, our faith is dynamic, it's exciting, we're ready to tell everybody about God because he's so amazing and wonderful. And by, by the way, this, this week, uh, lots of publicity going around about a guy called Kanye West. Anybody ever heard of Kanye West? Yeah, I've heard of him, and I, I usually wasn't too excited about him. But this week, he's come out that he's met Jesus, he's given his life to Christ. And Kanye said, that he was being asked, so... Are you now a, a Christian music artist? And he said, I'm a Christian everything. You know? So exciting to see young faith, vibrant faith. But as we, we grow, get older and we keep journeying, our, our theology starts getting all sorted out. And we understand how to systematize God and put him in, in these boxes and everything. And, and, and when that happens, often our passion wanes. And our ability to trust God and do extreme things for God or at God's calling, at God's command, wanes with that passion. Because we, we've got to make it all work out now and, and put it all within the, the confines of what we understand. Looking at verse 9, back to the Abraham story, it says, When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. 
Abraham named the place Yahweh Yara, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Abraham's righteous response to the ridiculous request ended in a remarkable result. Did you read that? Did you hear that as I read it? It says that Abraham built the altar, put the wood on it. Probably Isaac was helping him, I'm guessing. And then he ties up Isaac. How old did I tell you Isaac was? It's late teenagers, right? And he's over 100, probably close to 120 at this point. I'm 52. And my sons are... 30 and 28, but even when they were 20 and I was 42, if they didn't want to be tied up and put on an altar, what do you think my chances are? Not much. Much less if I was 120 and they were 20. Isaac had to be cooperative. Isaac had watched his father's faith. Abraham had to have told Isaac what was going on. And Isaac had to have said, yeah, yeah, dad. Fathers, leaders, mothers, think about your kids as we lead our children. Let them see a great faith in us so that they would be willing to do anything. They would be willing to get on that altar. Again, not advocating child sacrifice. He picks up the knife then. And he's about to plunge that knife into Isaac's chest. And I, I cannot fathom the emotion that, that he would have been dealing with right there. Can I really do this? There would have been tears. I imagine he would have been sobbing probably uncontrollably and struggling. And just before he was going to insert the knife in his son's chest, the voice came, Abraham, Abraham. He said, yeah. I'm listening. I'm here. God intervened at just the right time. At the last possible second, he said, Abraham, you've passed the test. If I was Abraham, I thought, this was a test? Seriously? You know what you're doing to me here? Abraham's more spiritual than I am. So what did he do? He worshiped God in that place. He, built, he had the altar all built and everything, and he knew a sacrifice needed to be given to worship God, and he looked over, and there's a ram caught in the bushes. God provided. Abraham named that place Yahweh Yaira. God provides. So what can we learn from Abraham's experience? First of all, where God guides, he provides. You've probably heard that if you've been around church, church circles for years and years and years. But it's true. I try to get away from saying that today because it's almost colloquial. But the ridiculous request did not match human reasoning, reasoning, even a little bit. It didn't make any sense. You see, seeing the end of the story, when we sit here in this sanitized place and we hear the end of the story, we can say, woo yay, God is good, and we see it all. It was ridiculous because Abraham didn't see the end of the story. Abraham's confidence had to be in who he knew God was, not in seeing the end of this. He had to have confidence in who God was, that he was Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Yireh, the provider, if he was going to have the faith to execute this. And he did. For you and I, when God is leading us into something scary, something that doesn't make any sense, something that may cost us heaps, that may derail what we thought our future was going to be, we have to, like Abraham, trust God. When we can't see the end, that's when our faith is tested, when we don't know what the end is going to look like. We need to remember that we can't see the end, but God does. And what he's asking us to do. So where he guides, he provides. Where God's provision, we we see God's provision when we step out in faith. 
You know, I talk to people sometimes, and I, I experience this uh, myself, that we see a ridiculous quest, request uh, that God's asking us to do, and we say no. We don't see God providing. And, and, and sometimes it, it kind of goes like this. It's, it's like, well, I believe God wanted me to do this, but he hasn't provided for me to do this. You know why God hasn't provided for you to do that yet? Because you haven't taken any steps that direction yet. God doesn't need to provide if you're not moving. If God asks you to do something, start moving that direction. And friends, I would say you, you've got to be all in with this. For Abraham, if God didn't come through, his son was going to die. We need to be all in in what God is asking us to do. So much so that if we fail, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be terrible if we fail. If God doesn't come through, that's where real faith is on the edges. That's where real faith is attempting great things for God because we believe that God is in it. We believe God's asked us to do it. So we say, yes, I'm going. And if I fail, I'm going to look like an idiot. And that's okay. For following God, he will step in. He will provide. You know, God provides and it comes just at the right time. He didn't provide. They didn't get to the top of the mountain and then Abraham saw the ram in the, in the bushes. He saw the ram after God had stopped him with the knife in his hand. It's the last moment, last possible moment there. Abraham was about to sacrifice his son. You know, we've talked mostly today about the big things, the extreme things, about how God provides. But you know, God provides for our daily needs as well. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25 says this, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What shall we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. God doesn't just provide in the extreme. Think about your own life, your everyday life. He provides food. He provides clothes. He provides shelter. For many of you, most of you, he provides work so that you can make a living. Many of you, he's provided children, grandchildren, spouses. God provides in our day-to-day -day life, not just these extreme things. You know, this account that we looked at in Genesis chapter 20, 22, was actually a foreshadowing, foreshadowing of God's greatest provision for mankind. John chapter 1, verse 29 says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, God's greatest provision was to meet our greatest need. You and I, every single one of us, were all born into a desperate situation. Our ancestors, all the way back to Adam and Eve, sinned. That's what the Bible calls it when we do things that God doesn't like, that don't, don't align with who God is, that are unrighteous. And that sin that was passed on to us demands a payment. And it's a debt that is so great, you can't pay it. There is nothing you can do to work it out. You know, sometimes when we're afraid God's not going to provide, we start trying to work things out ourselves. Anybody do that? Yes? Yes? This is one you won't work out yourself. You're not going to be good enough. You're not going to earn favor with God because you're, you're such a wonderful person and you've been so noble and you've given to charities and, and all of that. So God did this. It says this in Galatians 4, but when the right time came, remember that? God provides at just the right time. God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. It's another name of God that we're not going to even explore, but it's Daddy. 
We are God's sons and daughters through Jesus Christ if we've accepted that payment that he made for us. If you're here today and you haven't done that, I want to encourage you. Talk to somebody. Talk to the person you're sitting close to. Come up after the service and and talk to me. Talk to somebody else up the front. We'd love to tell you how you can call God Daddy, how you can have an eternal relationship with him. As we wind this up, I want to ask you, whether you know Jesus or whether you don't, most of us do in this place, what is it that you're not trusting God for? What is it that he's asking of you that you think is too big? Maybe it's trusting him for salvation. Maybe it's going through the waters of baptism. Maybe it's serving or volunteering in a ministry and you just think, it's just too big for me. Maybe it's in the area of giving. You say, I I can't see God providing you. You haven't seen my finances. You haven't seen my finances. God provides. Maybe it's serving overseas in mission. I, I don't know what, how big it is for you that's too big. But I encourage you to trust God. See, we are called to live by faith in his promises, not in explanations. We may not have all the answers to all of our questions. We may not know the where. When Abraham first encountered God, when God spoke to him, he said, I want you to go to a land that I'll show you later. We may not know the when. Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham and many others looked forward to the promise that was to come, but they didn't know when, but they had faith that God would provide. We may not know how. Abraham and Sarah were told they were going to have a a child in their old age, and that was impossible, but they trusted God would provide. And we may not know why. It may be a ridiculous request. There's no explanation given to Abraham until the end of why he asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac. And then God said, it was just a test. Do you love me? Will you do anything for me? Will you follow me? My friend, today, if we are not relying on God's provision, then we are settling for far less than God wants for us. If we are operating in only what we know and can do and see and think and accomplish, we're settling for far less than God wants for us. What would it look like to trust God as Yahweh, Yahweh?